welcome to the Broadway.com show, filmed in New York's historic Brill Building. I'm Imogen Lloyd Webber. And I'm Ryan Lee Gilbert. This week, we get the scoop on the off-Broadway productions of Relevance and Fire and Air, head backstage at School of Rock, and more. And later, we sit down with Eve Ensler to discuss her newest solo show in the body of the world. But first, let's get started with the news. What's the buzz, Ryan? Broadway has officially got the beat. Head Over Heels, the new musical featuring the songs of the Go-Go's, has found a home on the Great White Way. The production will play the Hudson Theatre, with previews slated to begin on June 23rd and an opening set for July 26th. Head Over Heels will first play an out-of-town engagement at San Francisco's Curran Theatre from April 10th through May 6th. The cast will feature Rachel York, Jeremy Kushner, Alexandra Sosha, Taylor Iman Jones, newcomer Bonnie Milligan, Andrew Durand, Tom Allen Robbins, and RuPaul's Drag Race star Peppermint, who will be the first trans woman to create a principal role on The Great White Way. Remind me what this one is about again? Remember, it's based on Arcadia, the Elizabethan pastoral romance. Oh, uh, right. They're invited. Beth Level, Brooks Ashmushkas, and Christopher Sieber will reprise their roles from the Alliance Theatre world premiere in the Broadway production of The Prom. They'll also be joined by Caitlin Kinnunen, Angie Schwara, Courtney Collins, Isabel McCalla, Josh Lamon, and Michael Potts. Directed and choreographed by Casey Nicolor, the buzzed about new musical comedy features a book by Bob Martin and Chad Begelin, with music by Matthew Sklar and lyrics by Begelin. The prom is scheduled to open on November the 15th at a Schubert venue to be announced. Do they have proms where you grew up, Imogen? You mean promenade? No, but let's move on. The 2018 Grammy Awards took place at Madison Square Garden this past weekend, and Broadway certainly came to play on music's biggest night. Two-time Tony winner Patti LuPone offered a show-stopping performance of Don't Cry For Me, Argentina from Evita and earned a standing ovation. Hamilton mastermind Lin-Manuel Miranda nabbed his third Grammy for the Moana tune How Far I'll Go, which earned the award for Best Song Written for Visual Media. And Dear Evan Hansen garnered the award for Best Musical Theatre Album, making Grammy winners of Benj Pasek, Justin Paul, and Ben Platt, who also took the stage to perform the West Side Story tune somewhere on the big night. In other Dear Evan Hansen news, Taylor Trench joined the Grammy-winning cast. Yes, they all received trophies a little bit earlier than expected, stepping in for previous headliner Noah Galvin on January 30th. Look out, because here she comes. Waitress alum and Greatest Showman breakout star Kiala Settle is set to belt out Benj Pasek and Justin Paul's Oscar-nominated song This Is Me at the 2018 Academy Awards. If her performance of the number as Letty Lutz, aka the Bearded Lady, in the P.T. Barnum biopic is anything to go by, Settle will stop the show on the telecast. The Oscars is scheduled to air live on ABC on March the 4th and O oh, will be watching. One of Broadway's great ones is coming to a city near you. The hit new Broadway musical A Bronx Tale will launch a North American tour during the 2018-19 season, including engagements at Los Angeles' Hollywood Pantages Theatre, Fort Lauderdale's Broward Center, and additional cities to be announced in the coming weeks. Casting for the touring production will be announced at a later date. Keep an eye out for when this thrilling doo musical brings Belmont Avenue to your town. With Frozen Fractals in the New York air comes exciting news for Frozen fans. Four brand new songs written for the Broadway production will be released on consecutive Fridays beginning on February the 23rd, the day after the musical's first Broadway performance at the St. James Theatre. Penned by Oscar-winning songwriting team Kristen Anderson-Lopez and Robert Lopez, the four new numbers include Monster, a new Act 2 solo for Elsa, What You Know About Love, a new duet for Anna and Kristoff, Dangerous to Dream, a new number sung by Elsa, and True Love, a new Act 2 solo for Anna. The songs were recorded by the Broadway cast featuring Casey Levy, Patty Muran and Jelani Aladdin. This is when we mention the cold never bothered us anyway, right? When we come back, we get a sneak peek at the Encore's production of Hey, Look Me Over. Check out School of Rock frontman Justin Collette's dressing room and more. This week on Broadway.com, the Phantom of the Opera vlogger Allie Ewalt celebrates 30 years of the record-breaking show, Once on This Island star Haley Kilgore strikes a pose, the Lion King star Jelani Remy kicks off his new vlog, and more. On the outside, always looking in, will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass, I'm waving through a window. Hi, I'm Rodney Ingram. I'm Ali Ewalt. And I'm Peter Gebach. And you're watching the, the Broadway.com Broadway show. Welcome back. 
On stage, Justin Collette brings down the house as wannabe rock star Dewey Thin in Andrew Lloyd Webber's School of Rock with his exuberant stage presence and killer comedic timing. We recently went backstage with Collette, and it's safe to say he's as hilarious and rock and roll as his character. Check out his five favorite things and learn all about his Hootie and the Blowfish obsession in his dressing room. Hi, I'm Justin Collette and I play Dewey Finn at School of Rock on Broadway and I'm gonna show you five of my favorite things in my dressing room. One of my favorite things is I, I split the role of Dewey with my friend uh, uh, Connor Galuli and a couple of other guys and after every show we leave a little post-it uh, uh, for us, uh, for the next Dewey who's coming in the next day and uh, as you can see they're gathering around uh, uh, the mirror and that's, that's thing one that cheers me up. Second favorite thing is my gear. So we have, uh, I'm talking like music gear, not head gear. Uh, so this is a, a Fender Stratocaster that I, I got. I, I brought in and we had it mounted, which is pretty cool. These are a couple of amps, a guitar one and a bass one for when we jam. So the kids come down usually at 15 minutes and we jam before the show, which is really fun. Uh, this is another one of my amps, Fender one here. We have an acoustic guitar over there that's a, a Tanglewood. Another one of my favorite things is I get a shower in my dressing room and there's a thing in it if you want to come in and check. I have a little speaker that I warm up with, with before the show and uh, I also use it to listen to my hootie. Another one of my favorite things is I have a secret stash of Canadian candy that I have people smuggle here for me when they come. Got ketchup chips, got hickory sticks, got a bunch of Jalouis. I'm, I am the character that I play. Another one of my favorite things you won't find if you look around, but if you look down, I got this awesome carpet that after the show, this is such an exhausting show and it's like a really stressful role. And so just having a nice carpet after the show, just to do this, just do better this than, oh. My name is Justin Collette. Thank you for coming into Dewey Finn's dressing room. Ugh. Please come see School of Rock the Musical, the Winter Garden Theater, Broadway, New York City, New York, Earth. Get yourself a rug. This production is going to put a whole lot of dream stage scenarios on our wish list. Hey Look Me Over is a collection of opening numbers, grand finales, and other excerpts from beloved shows that have not yet bowed at encores on the City Center stage. We got a sneak peek at rehearsal with a superbly starry cast. Take a look. Hey, Look Me Over is about, I think it's about eight different Broadway shows, two or three songs from each one, very cleverly put together into an evening. It's um, a chance to show Man in Chair, this character I created in The Drowsy Chaperone, in the real world. He's a subscriber to Encores, and he's had some issues with the programming over the years, and so he's, he's come and he's going to present his own evening. And that's, that's sort of the conceit. It's wonderful to be back. Uh, last time I did a show for Encores was 20 years ago, 1998. So it's been a while. I've never done an Encores before, so this is my very first time, so I'm very excited. You know, it's an amazing group of people, and everybody just kind of throws their talents into a mixing bowl, and it comes out a show in a week and you're like how did that happen it's a celebration of 25 years of encores but instead of looking back it's looking ahead to shows that haven't yet been done at encores and ones that the man in the chair feels really have been neglected it's an opportunity to take a jewel that has been buried and put it back on stage and make it alive again and that's the wonderful thing about theater with so many big broadway names there's a whole lot of talent headed to the city center stage according to the cast it's a total love fest off stage you get to be in a room with all these friends and colleagues and also n new friends and colleagues who you've never gotten to work with before and so you get these wonderful people and Great reunions and good times. Nancy Opal and I went to Juilliard together. <laughs> Come on. Uh, Carolee, uh, you know, I, I've known for years. BB and uh, Judy. So it's kind of old home week, but also you realize how uh, small the community is and how talented and awesome everybody is. In the world premiere production of Fire and Air, 
Acclaimed playwright Terence McNally explores the rich history of the Ballet Russe, Sergei Diaghilev's groundbreaking dance company. We headed downtown to Classic Stage Company to check in with star Douglas Hodge, who plays the tempestuous impresario at the heart of the drama. Fire and Air is really the story of Diaghilev and Le Ballet Russe. Uh, Diaghilev was an um, incredible producer, really. He, he said he didn't have any talent of his own, but he clearly did. He was a brilliant pianist and uh, he loved ballet and he formed a synthesis of music, art and decor design. He uh, employed people like Picasso, Stravinsky, Debussy. You could almost say that Diaghilev, that ballet wouldn't exist anymore. Probably would have died if it hadn't been for him. Working with John Doyle, uh, he's Scottish, which means he's mean and uh, tough and uh, economical. Uh, but his whole artistic impulse is to take away, constantly to strip away and to constantly, you know, I mean, he'd, he'd love it if the audience came in and used their own imaginations. He feels that on the bare floorboards with a few chairs and a few lights and the audience in full sight, they can just get very close up to the acting and intimate. And Terence, uh, yes, um, latterly in his life has written this extraordinary love letter really to Diaghilev and to that period and he seems to know everything about it. But it is essentially, it's extremely poetic and it's a pean to all the the things that we're sort of missing at the moment, you know, the, the grace and harmony and beauty and elegance and manners and uh, that whole world that is so important, that redresses the levels of barbarism in the world, I believe, you know, um, he, he has written this love letter to. Hodge reveals what it's like for him to be at the centre of a cast filled with acclaimed talents. Well, they're fabulous. And also it's, um, well, Ma yeah, Maren Maisie is a miracle. Uh, yeah, Marsha, four Oscar nominations, I think. John Glover, a, um, a legend in his own right. Those three are just extraordinary stanchions to base a play on. And then there's these two young guys um, who can incredibly both ballet dance and act. Um, which is uh, something I have never managed in my life. So yeah, we do have the young and the and then the more experienced actors in the cast. It's a play about art and a play about poetry and a play about beauty, and it's written as a poem. And I think these are tough, brutal, unpoetic times. There's lots to discuss that's current and relevant, I think. But essentially, it's um, a gentle, beautiful piece about beautiful things. We have a feeling audiences will be taking to Twitter after catching this play's world premiere. J.C. Lee has penned Relevance, which stars Tony winner Jane Howdyshell and Tony nominee Pascal Armand at odds as a celebrated author and a veteran feminist warrior. When a heated exchange between the two women goes viral, well, you'll just have to see the play at MCC and find out. We chatted with the cast to get the scoop on this brand new work. Relevance is about an older feminist thinker who, at a literary conference, on stage with a younger African-American feminist thinker comes into conflict. What drew me to this project is how relevant it actually is. I feel like it is literally in the center of conversations that I have been having for the last, you know, two years um, about um, intersectional feminism, about how the left um, deals with each other. What attracted me to the role itself was its complexity. There's not very much gray in her, it's kind of black and white. But also the actual themes that are discussed in the play are very prescient, important, and that was stimulating and challenging and exciting to me. It's a great time for this, coming off the Me Too movement or right in the middle of it. So I'm very happy to be doing my part for the movement. It's an extraordinary piece of writing becoming more and more extraordinary as we go. Uh, J.C. Lee's work is, not only his work, but his way of working is, it's so collaborative and so just frighteningly intelligent. I started writing the play back in 2015 and it was sort of a, poli a polite critique of liberalism on a certain level and in the wake of the election took on a different kind of urgency and now it feels like it's a reckoning for progressives, the play, on some level, in terms of how people move forward politically uh, in this new environment. Feminism, the Me Too movement, and social media are among the hot topics relevance will bring center stage. The cast shared what they hope audiences will take away from the show.
I hope that audiences um, are challenged. I hope that what they think they know about themselves and their friends and colleagues gets um, you know, shaken up a little bit. I want audiences to take away the idea um, of having discussions again. I, I, think, I, I think social media is great, and as this play points out, it makes people have a voice who wouldn't otherwise have a voice. But I think sometimes we lose just a, a dialogue. I hope people go home examining their own lives and where they stand on the issues that are um, discussed in the play, and perhaps the play will have opened their eyes or their minds or their hearts in ways to things they thought they knew they believed but needed to re-examine. Well, I want them to have a good time, but then I also want them to take this conversation outside of the theater and find out what their place is in the discussion, in the debate. It, it doesn't just stop once you leave the theater. When we return, Eve Enser tells us all about her autobiographical one-woman show in the body of the world. Go ahead, throw your rocks at me. Baking a pie is easy, if you know how. I'm still standing. If only life were as easy as pie. Waitress is a hit, raise the New York Times, with songs by Grammy-nominated artist Sarah Bareilles, an uplifting celebration of love and laughter. Sugar, butter, flour. Eve Ensler is a playwright, performer, and activist. Known for the global phenomenon, the vagina monologues, her newest theater piece is adapted from her memoir, In the Body of the World. Now playing at Manhattan Theater Club, the solo show connects her cancer diagnosis to her work with female survivors of violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo, her own childhood trauma, and more. I sat down with Ensler to talk about bringing this deeply personal story to the stage. Eve, it is an honor to have you here today because I am such a fan and such an admirer of your Thank work. You. Thank you very much. Your new play is so moving, it leaves no feeling unfelt. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you wanted to take this story of yours, which is so deeply personal, and write a memoir and then adapt it for the stage. Well, I don't know at the beginning that I was planning to do this on stage. I did it as a memoir. Um, I think I wrote it for many reasons. I think um, having gone through this huge process, um, when I had stage four cancer eight years ago, um, it was just this incredibly powerful, emotional, political, spiritual, mystical experience. And I wanted to write about that. And, and I, in a weird way, the book was really the completion, I, what I thought was the completion <laughs> of the experience. And then um, Diane Paulus up at ART, American Repertory Th um, Theater, read it. And she just suggested to me, wouldn't this be an amazing one moment show? And I think secretly, there might have been that idea embedded in me somewhere, but when she said it, it was like, wow, that would be really intense and really exciting to see if we could make this into a theater piece. And so we embarked on that. And actually, I'm really beginning to see, performing it every night, how this is really the completion <laughs> of that whole kind of alchemic journey that I had when I was both working and supporting and being in solidarity with women in Congo, where we were opening the City of Joy, which coincided with me being diagnosed with stage four cancer. Let's talk about that connection because so much of this play is about connecting the inner and the outer. Tell me how that occurred to you, how that, you talk about being in your body. I wanna know exactly what that means. One thing I know from my own experience, having been molested and beaten very severely as a child, is that when you are attacked, when violence happens to you, you have to leave your body because your body became, really becomes this landscape of terror, of trauma, of loneliness. You, you, you can't bear to be in it because all the memories are there, all the So betrayals. it's self-protection in a way. Yeah, it's self So you, you disassociate from mm -hmm. yourself. And I think the, the sorrow of that and the bad news of that is that when women are not in their bodies, they're not in their sexuality, they're not in their imaginations, they're not in their power, they're not in their energy. And so we're losing you know, massive amounts of brilliance, intelligence, drive, energy that could be turning this whole world that we're living in around. And I think, um, I thought having written the vagina monologues, then written the good body, then written play after book, that, okay, I think I'm in my body now. And then I got cancer. And I woke up after a, a nine hour surgery, missing seven organs, 70 nodes, things replaced, cut, rearranged. 
But it was really amazing. I was lying there with tubes coming out of me, and I was in my body. I was a body. And I think what it means is that we're not disassociated from ourselves. We're not living someone else's life. We're not living through someone else's experience. We're actually having our own experience and trusting our own experience. What I love about your work is that you often say what is unsaid and you confront what people are denying. And because of that, I think you have become the receiver of other people's stories. Mm. I mean, I'm sure the Vagina Monologues was, of course, a global sensation and you did it all over the country as well. How do you grapple with all of these women and men telling you about their trauma? I'm glad I heard those stories. I'm glad I heard those stories. I'm glad I went to Afghanistan and Congo and Haiti and Kosovo and India. You know, I, I got to go to 75 countries and sit with women in all kinds of refugee camps and war zones and, and beautiful situations and, and difficult situations. And I got to see this incredible story of women, both the horror story, but also the vitality of women and the fierceness of women and the imagination of women. I got to see that around the world. And I think now I, I am getting a, a bunch of emails since the show started it. And it's, it's amazing to see the kind of things people are sharing with me, particularly men. One of the things that really struck me about the show is how personal it was, not just about your cancer diagnosis or about your work with women, which everyone pretty much knows about, but about how you had to deal with your own sister, your own mother, because so many people can work for women or talk about sisterhood, but then dealing with their own family members is often the toughest thing. No, there's always a divide. You're great in the world, and then you go home to your family, and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm a horror. <laughs> I'm not practicing anything that I preach. Um, you know, for me, the whole journey with cancer was unbelievable. It was almost like the great divine mother just said, okay, I'm going to throw you everything so you can just blow out every socket and be, and be changed. And so my mother died during chemo, which was really hard. But it was also like I had an opportunity to really go down and be with her and love her and make peace with her. And my sister came back into my life and was totally nurturing and beautiful. And that was this incredible. So there was a lot of healing that happened. And there was also um, a lot of stuff I had to face. And I didn't know if I was going to die. Like, I really didn't all through and, and up until three years after, you know. So when you're on that perch, it's a very incredible place. It's a very alchemic place. It's a very, it's a very shamanic place because you are, you're so close to your death that you can actually see your life in a very different way. And all that is insignificant and petty and it just falls away. Mm -hmm. And the, what matters becomes uttermost, you know? And that's amazing. It surprises me that you said that you didn't think this was going to be a theater piece because that is so fundamental to who you are. You are a playwright first, I always think. I know you're an activist as well. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think it's probably because of what this play requires. <laughs> there was like some part of me that was like... It's raw. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, this, this is... It t you cannot do it but to give everything to this. You can't pretend. And so I think probably I wasn't opening my eyes yet to the reality of what this would mean um, and, and what it would call up and what it would demand. Because know? this is your story and it's personal in a way that the Vagina Monologues was not, although that had personal pieces in it, what did you learn from Diane Paulus in taking a look at it with fresh eyes? Oh, Diane's such a brilliant director and such a wonderful person. It's one of the best experiences I've ever had in my theatrical life. I think what Diane did, um, first of all, I never saw myself as an actor. I kind of saw myself as this person who performed my work. So, <laughs> you know, usually I had cards and, and she was like, no, we're going for it. Like, you're going to you're gonna be an actor. So she really pushed me to do things I never thought I could do. What was the writing process like for you? Because this was something that was so personal to you, I assume you weren't taking notes while you were no, going through chemo. No, I didn't take notes. It was, it was very... Did you have to relive it while you were writing? Yeah, I did. And now you're reliving it on stage. I used to live now. in Paris, and, and I went to Paris, and I was there for months, and I literally... Writing the book was like, like my body wrote the book. And there'd be days when I'd be wailing on the floor. There'd be days where I would just cry the whole day. Because it, my body remembered it. Mm -hmm. I didn't remember it. So I had to just be in my body to write the book. It's so theatrical. 
and you have people get into their own bodies in the audience because you get people on their feet. Is that fun for you to do? So much fun. I was a little scared in New York because we know <laughs> that you know the New Yorkers are sometimes you know refusers in nature. Yeah. But you know what I realized? Everybody wants everybody wants to connect. We can pretend in the city in our black and our cynicalness that we're but you know everybody here wants to connect. We're all lonely in this neoliberal capitalist culture. We're all isolated. We're all by ourselves. Everyone's busy feeling they didn't add up or measure up. They're not good enough. You know, everybody, I don't care who you are. And it's all what keeps us in our place, what keeps us beholding to these autocrats and these billionaire politicians who are ruling our world. And when we connect, when we feel each other, when we dance together, when we laugh together, then we are reminded of our power, of our, not the power over, but our power to love, our power to connect, our power to care. And I think that that's really what's happening in the theater. There's just a lot of connection happening, and, and not in a schmaltzy way, but mm -hmm. in a way where we're, we're going through something together. I love that your bio says that Eve Ensler lives in the world. Mm. What's more truthful than that? That's where I live. <laughs> that's where you live. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know that I believe in countries, you know? I believe in people, I believe in hearts, and I think any places where we have to have borders or walls or divisions or subdivisions, they really don't interest me. You know, I want to live in this world where everybody's in it and everybody's included and no one gets left out and no one gets thrown out or deported, you know. Eve, thank you so much and congratulations on this piece, it's really thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much, I'm happy to talk to you. When we come back, we watch Ben Platt's incredible performance from the 2018 Grammy Awards. On the outside, always looking in, will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass, I'm waving through a window. Hi, I'm Lily Cooper and I play Sandy Cheeks in SpongeBob SquarePants and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Thank you for watching the Broadway.com show. We leave you with Ben Platt's amazing rendition of Somewhere from West Side Story from the 2018 Grammy Awards ceremony. See you next week.